How many times have you seen Scream? I saw that movie 20 goddamn times! Have you ever wondered who killed who? What if one of the most popular opinions about one kill in particular has been wrong? all along. What is up, Nerd Detectives? Welcome back to another Scream Breakdown. Big shots if you checked out the Scream 1 Breakdown. If you haven't, well, go back and watch it after this because today I'm about to crack the case on one of the most debated kills in Scream. Who killed Tatum Riley? Yeah, you're gonna love this one. It's a Scream, baby. I'm going to break down the internet rumors and myths and show you the true facts the movie gave us to really point out the identity of who the killer was in the garage. Before we get started, hit like or follow us if you're not already. And as a bonus, make sure you stay till the end as I'll be dropping a preview of the Scream 2 breakdown I'm working on. Now let's rewind a little bit and return to Woodsboro. As a fan of Scream, I'm very familiar with the popular theory that Billy killed Tatum. The Scream fandom wiki says it was Billy, there's a Screen Rant article that says it was Billy, it's a popular theory on Reddit, and even Zach Cherry, who I really look up to, has a whole video breaking down who killed who and also determines it was Billy who killed Tatum. This would make Billy the ghost face who ultimately attacks Tatum and crushes her in the garage door. Now, now, while I respect many people's hard research and work that went into attempting to prove it was Billy, my question is, what if they're all wrong? What if the popular theory is popular and false at the same time? Let's go through the movie, gather all the clues we can, and see if we can settle the debate if it was Stu or if it was Billy who killed Tatum Riley. So grab a popcorn, grab a beer, or grab a whiskey, and let us begin. Let's first go over the kill real quick, just in case it's been a while since you've seen the movie. The setting is Stu's house, where during the party we see Tatum go to the garage to grab more beers. She's stalked and surprised by Ghostface, and has one final ask. No, please don't kill me, Mr. Ghostface. I want to be in the sequel. She tries to make the great escape to the sequel through the garage door, but finds out that's the wrong way to get there. Ghostface then goes inside the house, and this is where the kill is completed without anyone noticing. With that in mind, let's go through the current points of Billy being the killer, because honestly, there's a large group of people online who are convinced it was Billy who did it. But where's the proof? I didn't kill anybody. Let's start with y'all's comments on my recent Scream Breakdown video because there were a number of comments saying it was Billy because of the way he looked at Stu when he came to Stu's party. Additionally, I had a comment that said Kevin Williamson, the writer of Scream, confirmed that Billy killed Casey, so I definitely had to look into this. As I googled relentlessly for tens of minutes, the only comment I could find from Kevin Williamson came from a Twitter reply in 2009. Kevin Williamson says on Twitter, Just watch Glee. That show makes me happy. It makes me sob too but it's a happy sob. At Jamie underscore M39 says, at Kevin Williamson, this bugs me. Who killed Casey Becker, Billy or Stu? Kevin Williamson replies, Stu. What are you saying? I killed her? Additionally, another comment said Skeet Ulrich, who plays Billy Loomis, said that Billy killed Tatum. So I went searching for that quote across Google, only to find countless interviews where he says this. Did Wes ever discuss with you who killed who? Uh, nobody ever knew. To be honest, <laughs> there were no conversations about it. I mean, I, you know, uh, I know Matt Lillard had a conversation with Kevin Williamson and he never thought out who, who was doing what. Well, maybe Matthew Lillard can tell us something different. We did the 20th anniversary with uh, Kevin Williamson and that question came up. Who killed who in the movie? Uh, we don't know. So it Kevin you, didn't even know. Yeah. The writer didn't even yeah. know. So to all the followers in the comments, sorry to burst your bubble, but it sounds like those myths are busted as neither Skeet Ulrich or Kevin Williamson have spilled the tea on who killed our favorite Scream 1 sidekick, Tatum Riley. Don't go there, Seth. You're starting to sound like some West Carpenter flick or something. Now that we've gone through the popular opinion a little bit and myth busted some speculated rumors, let's break down Tatum's murder in a way that has never been done before. Let's dissect the events leading up to Stu's party because I believe it's here where we will finally receive some real answers. Let's start here. I need your attention now, kids. The Woodsboro Police Department has issued a citywide curfew beginning at nine o'clock tonight. You see, because of the recent killings and attacks, the town of Woodsboro is under a curfew and everyone is looking to bunker down for the night. Had your kids, had your wife. It's also during this time, Stu decides he's going to host a party at his place where all the students will seemingly break curfew to have a little fun. Just a bunch of kids cutting it loose. It's also during this time we know Billy kills Principal Hembry. We also find out Principal Hembry's body is found hanging from a goalpost in the football field. Listen up. They found Principal Hembry dead. He was gutted and hung from the goalpost on the football field. We have to keep this in mind because we're going to come back to this a little later. Additionally, Stu has a chat with Randy at the video store. Why would he want to kill his own girlfriend? There's always some stupid bullshit reason to kill your girlfriend. He's got killer printed all over his forehead. 
See, the police are always off track with this shit. If they watch prom night, they'd save time. Fast forward to the party, and Stu asks his girlfriend a favor. Hey, grab another beer, would you? Hey, Tatum goes to grab beer, the door is closed behind her, and the killer is now hiding somewhere. Tatum is attacked in a bit of a clumsy manner and then is ultimately bested when she tries to escape through the doggy door in the garage. And we all know how this ends. The killer then exits the crime scene and goes back inside where the party is going on. Let's break this down in even further detail because I'm about to reveal some things that have never been called out. Let's start with the obvious. Stu asked his girlfriend to go to the garage. Clearly, we all know what that means. It's a trap! Now once Tatum goes to the garage, this is where we see new clues that are revealed. You see, as Tatum is searching for beers, the door closes behind her, but it doesn't close from inside the garage. It clearly closes from inside the house. Now, unless our killer is doing some David Blaine, Chris Angel magic, it definitely wouldn't be closing from inside the garage. Now, this makes sense as Tatum attempts to open the door, but it's clearly locked, so she decides to go out of the bigger door, but... No way. We got you. Not a chance. That plan is interrupted by the killer, but where did the killer come from? Let's rewind a little because we know clearly he's not visible on the walk from the fridge to the door, and he's also not in visible sight from the door to the house to the big garage door. So where was he this whole time? If the killer wasn't in the garage, where could he be? I'll give you a second to think about it. You think you got it? Let's see. If you said the killer was in the house, you'd be correct. Now here's the proof. The door is closed and locked from the inside of the house. Also, the light is turned off, but we see no one could have done it. This should tell us there's clearly a light switch in the house that the killer is using to turn off the lights. Also, being that there is no killer in Tatum's visibility range, that would mean when Tatum turns on the garage door to open it, the killer is listening on the other side of the door and waits just a few moments before coming in from the house to the garage to close the garage door. Now let's move on to the question we've all been waiting for. Was this Billy or was this Stu? Let's first start with a popular theory and assume this is Billy. First, let's look at how he attacks Tatum. He cuts her on the arm, then chases her and stumbles around till he realizes a knife may not do the trick. Once the deed is done, he then goes inside the house where seemingly he sneaks around with people inside to find a side door to go out of the house hides his costume in some bushes perhaps and goes around to the front where he meets Stu and gives him a look. Now this could have happened but I have one glaring question to this theory and to you if you believe this theory. And here it is. Why the hell wouldn't he just go into the garage door to go outside? I mean it's open. Think about it. Instead of going inside to sneak around and find a side door and risk being seen by someone in the party, he could bypass all of that risk if he just went right under the garage door and went outside. This is a zero risk move. He can also still hide his costume and he can still go to the front to meet Stu. So I ask, if it was Billy, why would he go inside the house instead of out the garage door? You have to do some big mental gymnastics in explaining why he went inside instead of going under the less riskier garage door. To me, that seems like a very big glaring hole in the argument for the killer in this case to be Billy. Now let's approach this from the other end of the spectrum and see if Stu could be the killer in this case. So again, we know Stu sends Tatum on an errand to fetch the beers. It's a trap! And well, if we're pretending the killer in this case is Stu, and if Stu was in the house, he could close the door, lock it, and turn off the lights from inside of the house. Additionally, if he was in the house, he could listen out for the garage door to open and know when to go into the garage. Now, once he's in the garage, this is where I believe he took some notes from Randy and applied them to this attack. Was that before or after he sliced and diced? <laughs> There's always some stupid bullshit reason to kill your girlfriend. Even the way Stu is clumsy shows in his attacks. I'd say that's it, right? That's about all the evidence. Oh, that's right. Many of y'all probably saying, Blake, how did Stu sneak away from the party and no one saw him while he was hosting a party? That doesn't make any sense. You're dumb. From a personal experience point, as somebody that's hosted a great deal of parties in my young adult years and one and two story houses, I will tell you from experience, you can dip away and make any excuse you want when someone asks you where you were. I went to the restroom, I was smoking, I was making a phone call. The bigger the house, the bigger the crowd, and the easier it is to get away. People are usually drinking and no one cares for the most part as long as they're having a good time. And here is where I present the golden bullet, the piece of evidence that backs up my claim that many people seem to disagree with. You 
see in a deleted scene, it's implied that Stu in fact went to get more beers after first asking Randy. I'll let the YouTube channel Beyond the Mask explain it more in depth. Suddenly Gail starts to cough. Gail, can I trouble you for some water? Stu, how about a beer? Randy, get the lady a beer. Randy, you get it. Stu knew that Randy wouldn't give up his position talking to Gail, so the excuse to exit to collect a beer for Gail was there. Stu Marker literally follows Tatum to the garage, and this deleted scene absolutely sets that up. I'm willing to bet this scene was cut due to just how obvious it is that Stu was a killer here. This was the clue we were missing all along, and fills in the gap of why the killer attacks like Stu, and why, wait for it, why he goes back into the house. It's because it's Stu, and he has to get back to hosting the party before he's gone for too long. Now this leaves us with two important things to wrap up because you see, we need to talk about the time jump from Tatum's murder to the next scene at the front of the house and the sudden appearance of Billy getting to the party and also the look he gives Stu. Because in all actuality, these are the two items that people who believe the Billy theory keep coming back to. First, we need to point out the use of time jumps in this movie because those time jumps not only move the story along, but also try to throw us off. For instance, the beginning of the movie time jumps from Casey being killed to Billy going to visit Sydney. Another big one is when the killer is stalking Sydney and Tatum in broad daylight, but then the next scene cuts to the video store where we see Stu and Billy, but we know after the fact that killer is one of them. So this tells us the movie is using edits to trick us and make us think things are happening immediately one after the other when really these events are separated by minutes. So why wouldn't the time jump from Tatum's attack to Billy showing up be any different? It wouldn't. These two events are not happening immediately one after the other, they are separated by a few minutes. The edit from one scene to the other is meant to throw us off just like the movie did earlier. And now we arrive at the look Billy gives Stu. What was that look about? Here's the thing, if Stu killed Tatum, which we have way more evidence to support, what the hell was Billy doing the whole time? Well see, remember earlier in the video when I said there was a point we would come back to? Listen up, they found Principal Henry dead. He was gutted and hung from the goalpost on the football field. We have to keep this in mind because we're going to come back to this a little later. That's the one. Let's talk about Principal Hembry for a second. Not just the murder, but what happened after. Hello? Yeah? Holy shit. They found Principal Hembry dead. He was gutted and hung from the goalpost on the football field. Now follow me here and let's put a few things together. We know the town is under curfew starting at 9 p.m., which means the killer would have to wait till then to make sure everyone is inside of their homes before he could hang Principal Henry's body up so as not to be seen. Now I've heard the theory on Zach Cherry's channel that Billy and Stu put up the body and then came back to Stu's place where Billy was hiding all night until he attacked Tatum. Again, a lot of mental gymnastics are going on here. Let's think about this logically though. If curfew is at 9 p.m., and most parties kick off at 9 or 10, then Billy and Stu likely could not have put up Principal Henry's body at night and then had time to come back to his house, which appears to be on the outskirts of town, without risking the chance of someone showing up early, questioning where they were, and seeing Billy before he reveals himself closer to the end of the party. This would mean that hanging the body was a one-man job done after 9 p.m., and if Stu is at the party for a good amount of the night, who does that leave us with? I didn't kill anybody. This means in fact when we see Billy, he really is just showing up for the first time, and the look he gives Stu would imply the deed is done and the principal's body is now on display at the school's football field. This look about the principal was essential to Billy and Stu's plan because shortly after Stu receives this information, Stu seemingly goes to the garage for more beer, where he would have seen Tatum's body, which he already knows is there because he killed her. It's shortly after this, he places a call to his house about the principal's dead body to help clear out the rest of the party. Oh. Before they prime down. Hey. And whose phone did he use to place the call to his house? Uh -huh. Man, oh, look at this. Ring, ring. Need this. Stu had Sydney's father's cell phone the whole night. To wrap this all up, Stu set up his girlfriend in a way she would be isolated. The style of the killer seems more like Stu. He had twisted motivation to do it, and it also makes sense why the killer goes back inside the house instead of sneaking outside. This all goes right in line with a deleted scene that was cut that implies Stu did indeed step away from the party to grab more beer. Additionally, when we place Stu as Tatum's killer, we can account for Billy handling the Principal Hembry situation and can also account for him hanging the body sometime after 9 p.m. The look Billy gives Stu is still symbolic, but not because of Tatum, it's because now the rest of their plan can continue in motion, and they have created a sneaky way to clear away any remaining lingerers at the party. Watch a few movies, take a few notes. <laughs> 
It was fun. And that, my fellow detectives, is all the evidence to support it was in fact Stu and not Billy who killed Tatum Riley. I didn't kill anybody. I'll be honest, I never thought I was going to make this video, but there was such a large amount of comments that said it was Billy, when again, the biggest thing to disprove that is why he would go inside the house once the kill is over instead of going out under the garage door where he would have immediately been outside and not risk being seen. The further I dug into this, it completely baffled me that Billy being the killer is such a popular idea when really the only evidence is him coming to the party and giving Stu a look. When you add up all the proof and clues, it's clear. Just because an idea is popular doesn't mean it's correct. I do want to give a special shout out to everyone who commented on the last video because the more I chatted with y'all about this movie, the more I knew I had to do a video on this kill because it seemed so divisive and controversial. So thank y'all for inspiring me. And as I promised, here's a small clip of the Scream 2 video I'm working on. Okay, let's get down to business. The way I see it, someone's out to make a sequel. You know, cash in on all the movie murder hoopla. So it's our job to observe the rules of the sequel. How do we find the killer, Randy? That's what I want to know. I told y'all it's small, but I am still working on it, and I had to take some time away from that to work on this one. But look out for Scream 2 in the not-too-distant future. In the meantime, drop a comment if you think I convinced you it was Stu, or let me know in the comments why you think it was still Billy. It's been awesome interacting with y'all in the comments, so I definitely look forward to hearing your thoughts in the meantime. Also, be sure to check out the first Scream video if you haven't, and check out some of the other murder mysteries I've broken down, because I think if you like Scream, you'll like those other ones as well. For now, I'm going back to the Nerd Cave to keep working on Scream 2. I really appreciate all the likes and shares, and Thank y'all for helping get the channel past 2,000 subscribers. It's kind of unreal how fast this channel is growing, and I really appreciate all the love. I know the whole team does as well. Be sure to follow me on all the social media platforms at Money Blakeweather. And for now, whether it's morning, evening, afternoon, whatever time you're listening to this, I do appreciate you. And until the next case, I will see you. Peace.